Hi, and welcome to another video in fluid mechanics. Up until this point, we have covered a bunch of dimensional analysis. This includes dimensional homogeneity, or how to solve problems without physics, and also non-dimensional numbers that we know and how we find new ones. We also physically explored the conservation of mass and momentum equations. These are laws that fluids must follow and the equations define their behavior. Today we pivot in this video series and start considering different types of actual flows. Specifically, we want to start exploring how we solve these conservation equations and get to meaningful answers for relatively simple flow fields. We begin with enclosed flows, which are among the easiest to solve. Specifically, the 2D enclosed flow, which is the closed channel flow. Let's jump in. Recall our conservation equations for an incompressible fluid in differential form for an Eulerian perspective in Cartesian space. First is the conservation of mass. And then we have the conservation of momentum, or Navier-Stokes equations. Here, I leave the skeleton as always, that's the same for all three equations red, and the interchangeable variables as white, which can either be uvw and xyz respectively. These are four independent equations. And we have four main unknowns, the three velocity components, uvw, and the pressure field, p. How do we solve these famously unsolvable equations? For the most part, approaching these equations has a common theme that we can summarize. The first thing you do when approaching either a real or academic flow problem is to observe it and set up your problem. For me, this means making a flow schematic and labeling meaningful parameters like wall height, flow properties, etc. Second, you need to identify your boundary conditions. They're called boundary conditions because a boundary condition is generally a known flow state at some place, x, y, z, or some time, t. A lot of times in solving the equations, we get unknown constants, and these boundary conditions help us find them. The third step is to determine your assumptions. Unless you're given them, like in most academic problems you would see in a class, you need to use your best judgment to determine fair assumptions for your problem. Is your flow a liquid? Boom, incompressible. Can you watch it for a long period of time and not see any changes? Well, it's probably steady. These assumptions are critical in simplifying our conservation equations, which is step four. We use the assumptions to pare down the conservation equations into something more solvable. With step five, we start with the conservation of mass because it's generally the most simple. Here, more often than not, we use this to get some condition on one of the velocities that we can bring with us to the next step. In six, we move on to the beastly conservation of momentum equations, or Navier-Stokes equations. With our assumptions, hopefully it's a bit easier to work with. From here, we solve them as best as we can using calculus and maybe some differential equation techniques. Then, we apply our boundary conditions to try and find unknown constants. At this point, maybe it's either solved or solvable. Most real-world flows are not solvable on pen and paper like this, but there are a bunch we can work with to learn more about the basics of flow solving. And that's the point of the next few videos. Let's try and apply this general process to solvable flows, and the first of which we will encounter are enclosed flows. Basic enclosed flows are generally solvable, and often the first step in learning fluid mechanics flow solving because of their simplicity. An enclosed flow is a flow surrounded by boundaries, including ducts, pipes, and channels. The biggest benefit to these types of flows is the enclosure stops them from being able to grow, and they eventually become fully developed. You will see this makes life a lot easier in the flow solving. The two-dimensional version of the enclosed flow is the closed channel flow.
Here we have flow between two parallel plates that extend effectively infinity in the third direction, meaning two-dimensional. Closed flows are generally organized by the flow driving type, which is based on the three force sources on the right-hand side of Navier-Stokes. First, there is the pressure-driven channel flow. You have a fluid between two parallel walls. On one end, pressure is higher than on the other end. The pressure differences drives a flow between the walls. Second, there is a gravity-driven dri channel flow, where gravity is a body force. Here, there is an angle to the walls relative to gravity, so the acceleration of gravity works to drive the flow downhill. Third, there is viscosity-driven channel flow. In this case, Flow is between two walls, where the walls have a velocity difference between one another. Here, I drew it as one wall being stationary, and one wall is a moving plate. The viscosity force pulls fluid along, and you get a flow between the plates. These three, on their own, are quite solvable with respect to the Navier-Stokes equations. We will treat them individually, but in reality they're often combined and a bit more complicated. Let's start with the pressure-driven channel flow. The first thing we do is sketch the flow and mark down meaningful parameters we might need. We have two parallel stationary walls, some flow between them, a pressure upstream and a downstream that are different. The coordinate system is Cartesian with x aligned with the flow, and the distance between the walls we label A and y equals 0 at the bottom wall, and y equals a at the top wall. That's our flow. Now, we have to use our judgment to come up with assumptions. First, let's assume that it's either a liquid or a slow-moving gas to assume that it's incompressible, so density is constant. Next, we assume it's steady, not changing in time. Our pressure driver is steady, so we have no reason to believe the flow is time-dependent. It is an enclosed flow, which has the feature of being able to fully develop. We assume since it extends very far into and out of the page that the flow is two-dimensional and there is no velocity in the z direction. These last three assumptions, steady, fully developed, and 2D, 2C, are general characteristics that require laminar flow. In a few videos, we'll cover the difference between laminar and turbulent flow, and how when flow is turbulent, we can't make these assumptions and life gets pretty difficult. And last but not least, there's no body force in our problem to be found. Now that we've gathered our assumptions, we need to identify our boundary conditions. Start with the no-slip condition. No-slip means that, at the location where the fluid meets the wall, the flow parallel to the wall must have the velocity of that wall. For us, that means that u at y equals 0 and y equals a is 0. The same goes for the w velocity because it's also parallel to the wall, if we had one, which we don't because of our assumptions. The second primary boundary condition is another wall condition called the no penetration condition. At the point where the fluid meets the wall, there cannot be a normal velocity. This means flow cannot penetrate through the solid wall. In other words, v at y equals 0 and a is 0. These are all the boundary conditions we'll need so we can get started. Our goal here is to solve for u, v, and w, the velocity field, as known functions. To get these functions, we need to start with the simple conservation of mass. If we apply our assumptions, two terms drop out. du dx is zero because it's fully developed, and dw dz is zero for two reasons. There's no w velocity due to being two component, and there are no changes in z due to being two dimensional. This leaves us with dv dy equals zero, which is a common occurrence with the conservation of mass equation. If we integrate this, we get that the velocity v must be a constant with respect to y. We also know that it is a constant in x because it's fully developed, and a constant in z because it's two-dimensional, so v must just be a constant. 
apply our boundary condition that v must be zero at the walls. If v is zero in one place and is a constant, it must be zero everywhere. v equals zero. We can apply this known to the conservation of momentum equations with our assumptions. Next, bring up the conservation of momentum equation in the x direction. We can remove a bunch of turns because it is steady, fully developed, two-dimensional, two-component, and there's no body force. In addition, we know v is zero from the conservation of mass. This simplifies to the following two-term equation. The pressure force is balanced by the viscous force. Notice there is absolutely no fluid acceleration left which was on the left-hand side of the original equation. If we integrate this, we can isolate the u-velocity field with two unknown constants. Because we have two constants, we need two boundary conditions to solve for them. Let's use the boundary conditions of u near the wall. The first boundary condition is that the velocity at y equals zero is zero. This lets us quickly get that c3 must be zero. The second condition is that the velocity is zero at y equals a. With a bit of rearranging, this tells us that c2 is one over mu times the pressure gradient times a over two. If we plug the constants c2 and c3 back into the original u equation, we get the u velocity function for pressure driven channel flow. And we did it. We now know the three velocity components, u, v, and w, as known functions. We got u from the conservation of momentum just now, v from the conservation of mass, and w was an assumption. For the velocity field, there's no reason to continue on to the conservation of momentum in the y and z directions. The only thing those equations would tell us is that the pressure is not a function of y or z, and therefore is only a function of x. Presumably, this could easily be found by knowing the pressure at each end of your channel, which would give you the pressure gradient. This type of flow profile is parabolic, with a maximum velocity in the center and zero velocity at the walls. Moving on, we come to gravity-driven flow. It's the same process, so we can go a bit faster. Here, we sketch our flow. Angled walls moving downhill, with the angle between the center line and perpendicular to gravity being theta. The distance between the plates is a, and there is some flow that we're looking to solve for. x and y are in the orientation of the walls. However, we do add another direction, which will be helpful later as you'll see. The direction h is aligned with gravity. We have almost all the assumptions as before. It's incompressible, steady, fully developed, two-dimensional, and two-component. However, we do have a body force of gravity, so the no body force assumption doesn't apply here. Our boundary conditions are at the wall again and are the no slip and no penetration condition. We take our assumptions and boundary conditions as ammo and begin with the conservation of mass. Two assumptions makes it dv dy equals zero. Integrate this to find v is a constant, and our boundary condition at the wall for the v velocity tells us that v must be equal to zero. We can move right on to the conservation of momentum in the x direction. Steady, 
fully developed, 2c, 2d, take down a bunch of the terms here. v is zero from the conservation of mass. However, we do have a body force term left over due to gravity. This gets us that the viscous term is balanced by the pressure and the body force terms. Here, the acceleration of the body force term in the x direction is the x component of gravity because x and y are aligned with the flow, not gravity. So a sub x is g sine theta. However, we can't be a bit tricky with some trigonometry. If we look at the orientation of x and y and h as we set it up, notice the angle between x and the horizontal is theta. If we make a triangle where the hypotenuse length is dx, some length x, and the side length is negative dh because it goes below the horizontal, we find that sine theta is negative dh over dx. The reason we did this is because there is a partial derivative with respect to x on the pressure. If we can also get the partial derivative on the gravity term, it can be pulled out just like this. Let's integrate this twice to get a function for the velocity u with two constants, c2 and c3. As before, our two wall boundary conditions on u let us solve for c2 and three t c3. We plug these values for c2 and c3 back into the original u equation and we get the function of u velocity of gravity driven flow. And we're done. We now know u, v, and w. We got u from the conservation of momentum in the x direction, v from the conservation of mass, and w was assumed zero. Again, we don't need momentum in y or z. That was only if we wanted to know a bit more about the pressure. Eventually, we'll make use of the y and z momentum equations when we solve other flows, but not for the closed channel flow. And we move on to the last channel flow, viscosity-driven channel flow. We can sketch the flow. There is a stationary wall and a moving plate on top where the plate has a velocity in the horizontal direction, capital V sub zero. The plates are a distance A apart, and there is a flow being pulled along by the plate due to viscosity. I will leave this for you to try yourself at home. It's solved very similarly to the pressure-driven case. However, there is one small nuance. Up to this point, the u-velocity on both walls has been zero as a boundary condition. However, for this case, u at y equals a is the plate velocity, v0. So that's where it differs from pressure-driven channel flow. Give it a try and see for yourself and see how this changes the equations. And that's it for the three closed channel flows. Let's review. We started by considering our full conservation or Navier-Stokes equations and wondering how we go about solving them. There is a rough general strategy to flow solving. Sketch the flow, find boundary conditions, make assumptions, simplify the equations, and solve to the point that you need the boundary conditions. Enclosed flows represent a class of flows with boundaries on both sides and can be fully developed. Today, we concentrated on closed channel flows, specifically driven by pressure, gravity, and viscosity. When solving these types of flows, we found conservation of mass told us the vertical velocity was zero, and then the conservation of momentum in the x direction got us the u velocity field. The other conservation equations weren't needed. We completely solved pressure and gravity driven channel flow and left viscosity driven channel flow as a home exercise. I hope you enjoyed the video and thanks for watching.